I'm beginning on page 8. Now you notice on page 8, if you've carefully looked at your notes, that the beginning of this second presentation begins right where the first presentation began, but the first presentation I passed over uh, Exodus 31.13 and Ezekiel 20.10-13. Is everyone on page 8 with me? And the point that I saved for today because of time, if you go to Exodus 31.13, is that the Sabbath... Sabbaths are signs. Exodus 31.13 says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. And I'm saying there that in this verse and also in Exodus 20, that it's not Sabbath in the singular, it's Sabbath in the plural. If you wish to say that this is strictly the Seventh-day Sabbath, I probably won't argue with you. But I believe that it's talking about the Sabbath in a plural sense. Um, there are several Sabbaths that the Lord identifies. And what I'm saying is that they are identified as signs. And underneath in your notes, you have the word sign from Strong's Concordance. And then you have the definition of symbol from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And a symbol, it says, the sign or representation of any moral thing by the images or properties of natural things. The conclusion that I'm wanting to put in place here is that the Sabbath, in the plural, the Sabbath that the land rests every seventh year, the seventh day Sabbath, the Jubilee, which is the Sabbath, that they're signs. All right, and in this history that we dealt with last night, the reason that they could not enter the promised land is because they had forgotten the signs and wonders and miracles that were done in Egypt. Um, and if you remember in this history here, in Ezekiel 4, verses 1 through 6, where we read that it's noted, I believe, in verse 4, that Ezekiel's actions are a sign. Okay, so in these histories, signs are marked by the Sabbath. And how we relate to the signs that God give, gives to us is going to indicate whether we're obedient or disobedient. So that's one thought. But beyond that, what I'm saying is that the Sabbaths are symbolic. And I want to show you that they're symbolic even at the grammatical level. All right. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to show you, if you're willing to see, that the first verses of Leviticus 25 when connected with the fourth commandment, is establishing the year-day principle of Bible prophecy. And this has been established by William Shea, of course. And William Shea makes the claim that the first place in God's word that the year-day principle is marked is Leviticus 25. I don't agree with that, but I still agree with his premise. You notice under the seventh year, um, it says in Exodus 23, and Exodus comes before Leviticus 25. In Exodus 23, 10 through 12, it says, In six years thou shalt sow thy land, and shalt gather in the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat, and what they leave of the, leave the beast of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard, and with thy olive yard. Six days shall thy do thy work, and the seventh day thou shalt rest, thy, that thine ox and thine ass may rest, that the son of thy handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. So what I'm saying, if you're willing to see right here in Exodus, this connection between the land resting on the seventh year is, is connected with the seventh day Sabbath of rest. You see the year day principle there even before Leviticus 25. And this is in Exodus. But you can also see the year-day principle in the book of Genesis. You have it in Genesis 29, verses 27 through 28 says, Fulfill her week, and who's this? This is Jacob and Laban, and what's, what's Jacob fulfilling a week for? For Rachel and Leah, but this is the 2520, isn't it? This is Rachel and Leah. Um, fulfill her week, and we will give thee also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. 
A week is seven years. This is the year day principle right in Genesis. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. So you can see the year day principle in Genesis and Exodus. And William Shea teaches us that the first place it's found is in Leviticus 25. It's, uh, I agree with him, though, because the year day principle, rightly understood, is marking a test for God's people. And in Leviticus 25, you cannot separate Leviticus 25 from Leviticus 26. Leviticus 25 is the statutes connected with the sacred cycle of seven, letting the land rest on the seventh year. After having seven cycles of seven years, then you also let the land rest on the 50th year, which is the Jubilee. And all the laws connected with the Jubilee and the land resting are there in Leviticus 25. But then in Leviticus 26, we have listed the blessings if God's people would keep these statutes. And then in verse 14, it begins to list the curses if we reject these statutes. So what I'm saying is when... William Shea is marking that the first place the year day principle is found in God's word in Leviticus 25. Particularly when you understand that the year day principle that we often refer to is marking the rebellion or the obedience of God's people. Leviticus 25 and 26 is one of those places. The year day principle is the first thing that's mentioned in Leviticus 25. And therefore, the rest of the narrative, which includes chapter 26 is identifying whether you're going to be rebellious to this year-day principle or obedient to it. So that's what we're going to look at here. And in connection with that, the Sabbaths are signs, but I want you to see that at the grammatical level, even, that the Sabbath is a sign. And um, there's a brother in here, there's, there's lots of brothers in Adventism through the years that struggle with my presentations, and there's a brother in here that is one of those, and, and it's friendly, it's friendly, um, but my English grammar's poor, and he knows it, and it drives him crazy when I don't use proper English grammar, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? So, I'm being out front here, what I'm going to share with you is not a field of my expertise, but we're going to look at a little bit of the grammar of the fourth commandment and Leviticus 25, but don't think that I'm trying to deceive you into identifying myself as an expert in the grammar of Hebrew or Greek, let alone English. So in your notes, in Exodus 20 verses 8 through 11, there's a church we sometimes go and speak at that's close to our home. It's in Texas. We live in Arkansas. And one of the things we like about this church, it's, it's a not a black church, but it's black Seventh-day Adventists, um, at the worship hour, they always recite Leviticus 20, verses 8 through 10. We like that. That's part of their formality in beginning their worship service. So even though you may not recite it every Sabbath like that church does, I'm sure that we're all familiar with the fourth commandment in Leviticus 20, verses 8 through 11. So rather than read it, I'm just going to point some things out because... I always have more information than I should have, and I'm going to try move, moving quickly through some of this. You have Leviticus 20, verses 8 through 11 in here, and some of the things in there are highlighted. The first time I did this, I had some other things highlighted, and I'm going to tell you what they are. We're going to, we're going to discuss this word, seventh, that has been rested the seventh day and the seventh day. We're going to discuss the word seventh in detail. But in the fourth commandment where we see this Hebrew word that's translated as seventh, we also see the word six, six days. Uh, and we see the word rest. Okay, when you get to Leviticus 25, which William Shea informs us is the parallel to the fourth commandment here, it's the same Hebrew words for six and rested and seventh in Leviticus 25. That's one of his first arguments. Second argument is that the structure of the fourth commandment, the, the grammatical structure, the prophetic structure of the fourth commandment is in agreement with the grammatical and prophetic structure of Leviticus uh, 25, verses 1 through 7. But also the words. The words are the same. Sixth, seventh, rested, same Hebrew words. Okay. So you have in your notes Leviticus 25, verses 1 through 7. 
And if I've already lost you early on, what I'm telling you is this. I want to start by emphasizing that we've been informed that the Sabbaths are signs, and a sign means it's a symbol, it's symbolic. Okay? What's the symbol that you've been sanctified? The Sabbath, okay? So the Sabbaths are symbolic. I may be taking it a step further than most because I'm saying Sabbaths in the plural and saying that that's talking about all the Sabbaths of the Lord, not just the Seventh-day Sabbath. I'm also saying that the signs are something that we, we stand or fall upon. Okay? If we don't receive the signs that are given to us, we reject the signs, then we're going to end up in darkness. So as we're reading this commandment, this statute in Leviticus 25, and making the claim that this is the second part of the year-day principle, that the, the day is the Sabbath commandment in Exodus 20, that this is the year in Leviticus 25, we're also saying that this is a sign, and therefore it's a test, and when we see the year-day principle marked in Scripture, it's identifying the rebellion of God's people. And we understand that all the prophets are speaking more about the end of the world than the time in which they spoke. So this test here in Leviticus 25 and Exodus 20 is a test for God's people at the end of the world. So let's, let's read Leviticus 25 verses 1 through 7 and put that in place. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years, same Hebrew word as the Sabbath commandment, six. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou, thou prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year, in the seventh, the word seventh is what we're going to look at. In the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, and a, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed. For it is a year of rest, same word rest, unto the land, and the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you. Same word Sabbath, as in the Sabbath commandment. For thee and for thy servant and for thy maid and for thy hired servant and for thy stranger that sojourneth with it and for thy cattle and for thy beasts that are in thy land shall all the increase thereof be meat. Notice this, it's the same structure. Uh, the, you let the servants rest on the seventh day Sabbath and the this, this seventh year the land is resting. It's a rest for the servants and the cattle just like the Sabbath commandment. Okay. So what we're seeing in the Sabbath commandment is the day and what we're seeing in Leviticus 25 is the year. Okay, the seventh day is what we want to look at. Now, and so if you think it's a, a stretch to say that this is the year-day principle, notice what Sister White says in Manuscript Releases, Volume 6, page 394. I'm on page 9. Special laws were given to the Israelites in regard to the tilling of the soil. <laughs> Leviticus 25, 1 through 7 quoted. That's what we just read. These laws seem peculiar to those who have not known God's statutes, but the Lord knew better than man what arrangements to make with his people. These laws were written down, and the seventh year after they settled in Canaan was to be a Sabbath year. What's a Sabbath year? That's the year-day principle. Is it not? She's, she's very clear there. So we're, and, and she's marking the year-day principle after referring to Leviticus 25, verses 1 through 7. And sometimes in Adventism, because of our experience in Laodicea, we're not familiar with some of the basic rules of Bible study, but one of them is the rule of first mention. Mm -hmm. And it pervades the Bible from the beginning to the end, and it has certain components to it. But the first thing that's mentioned in Leviticus 25 is the year-day principle. And therefore, when you study Leviticus 25 and 26... If you understand the rule of first mention, then you know that you have to understand Leviticus 25 and 26 in the context of the rule of first mention. And the first thing that's mentioned is the year-day principle. So Leviticus 25 and 26 must be studied under the guidance of the year-day principle of Bible prophecy. Follow the logic there? Is everyone okay? All right. So let's look at the word seventh. I want to try to show you that the word seventh 
is symbolic even at the grammatical level. Once again, grammar, not my forte. All right. The Sabbath commandment, you see it there, rested the seventh day, the year of rest statute, the seventh year. Same Hebrew word. The word seventh, if you go to the Strong's, is 7637. It's an ordinal from 6657. And if you go to 7657, and if you've studied in your Strong's, this is what the Strong's does for you. On some words, it'll lead you down through the words that the word has been built from. This word seventh has been built from Hebrew words to reach the word seventh that we use. And the first thing we're told about this word is that it's an ordinal. How many know what an ordinal is? An ordinal number. You don't really have to know what it is. Okay, it's, it, it, it goes, it's marking order. Ordinal, marking order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All of those numbers, when they're expressed that way, are ordinal numbers. They're showing the order. But they're different than a cardinal number. Okay, cardinal numbers emphasizing quantity. But when you read the definition of an ordinal number and a cardinal number, they're exclusive of one another. Okay, a cardinal number is, is expressing quantity without any marking of order, where an ordinal number is expressing order. So let's go through this. I'm just I'm advanced, giving you some advanced understanding of this definition so we can make the punchline in a moment. This word seventh in the Sabbath commandment and in the land resting statute, it's an ordinal, 7657, seventh, and it says it's a multiple of 7651. I wished it wasn't a multiple because this is kind of a, an unnecessary thing to explain, but it's a little bit confusing if you have to do it. The word that we're looking here at is the word seven. Okay. But when seven is expressed as a multiple, it means when the word seven is used as in seventh or seventieth, or 17, a multiple is a word that is derived from the basic word. Okay, you follow me? So when it says it's a multiple of 7651, that really doesn't mean that's much to what we're trying to show you here. So don't spend a lot of brain power trying to figure that one out. 7637 is an ordinal from 7657, but 7657 comes from 7651. And 7651 comes from 7650. And 7651 is a primitive cardinal number. Now this is what I want you to see. That this word seventh, it's got a problem going for it. It's an ordinal that comes from a cardinal. And I don't know numbers any better than most of you probably do, or grammar any better than most of you probably do. But when you look at the definitions, you'll see that these are, these are two different things. Now notice, you have a definition of cardinal number. It says a cardinal number, a number such as one, two, or three used in counting to indicate quantity, but not order. That's a cardinal number. When using number words, it is important to keep the difference between cardinal numbers and ordinal numbers in mind. See, people that understand these things, they say, you need to know the difference between ordinal and cardinal because they're different. Okay, they're different. Cardinal numbers are counting numbers. They express absolute number without any implication of position. The ordinal numbers, on the other hand, are position numbers. They correspond to cardinal numbers but indicate position in relation to other numbers. Did I lose you? This is the only place in this presentation where I'm pretty certain I lose a certain percentage of people because because it's, I'm basing it on my understanding. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around this too. But what I'm saying is, this word seventh in the fourth commandment in, and in the land resting statute is both an ordinal and a cardinal number. It's teaching more than one thing. It's symbolic, even at the grammatical level. Okay, It has to be related to that way. It's a Sabbath, so we know it's symbolic. The land resting the seventh year is a Sabbath, so it, at the biblical level, it's symbolic, it's a sign. But even at the grammatical level, it's both an ordinal and a cardinal, and the only way you can bring that together is to understand that it's a symbolic number. 
And it's important to see that. It's important to see that. What's a, I asked this last night. I always ask this question for this point. What's a lion in Bible prophecy? It's Babylon. It's Satan. It's Christ. It's Judah. A lion is symbolic. And it has to be determined by the context. Okay, so when we're dealing with this number that's translated seventh here, if we're going to understand what it means, then it has to be based upon context. Okay, I recently listened to a sermon by a, a pastor in this area named Kirkpatrick, and his argument against the 2520 was a typical, you know, shallow argument. The only thing that I noted that he made against the 2520 in his presentation about the 2520, biblically, was he says that this word that's translated seventh here, which is also translated as seven, four times in verse eight, and then is translated as seven times, four times in Leviticus 26, though it's the same word, it's translated different ways in these passages. He says that you are to interpret the four places where it occurs in Leviticus 26 as seven times, as sevenfold. Okay, now, if you do your concordance search, that word sevenfold is how many times in your Bible? Five times. But that same word is also translated in a variety of other ways. One of the ways this word is translated other than sevenfold is oath. Okay, oath. Okay, that's one of the primary definitions of this word. Daniel 9.11's oath. Daniel 9.11, where he talks about the oath of Moses, that's this word. But my point isn't so much that. My point is this. How many times do you find the word oath in God's word? 57 times. So if, and that isn't the only way this word is translated. Sometimes it's just translated as seven. Sometimes it's translated as seventh. It's translated seven times some places. So, so if you're going to say, well, this word means sevenfold, because I find it that way five times in the Bible. Well, okay, if we're going to do it by how many times it occurs in the Bible, I overroll you just with oath, okay? But that isn't how we determine it, because it's symbolic. You it determine what a symbol is based up on context, not on how many times it occurs in this fashion in the Bible. Okay, you follow my logic? This is a symbol. That's why I'm taking time here. This word seventh, it's a symbolic word because it's the Sabbath. And at the grammatical level, it's two different things at the same time. That's a symbol. Isn't that what a symbol is? Okay, so that's in place. That was the hardest, the hardest part for me. And I'm going to move past denominative, which is also part of this story, but we're going to move past that. You've got my point, perhaps. Now, this is per I didn't design this for Sabbath school, but this is a perfect study for Sabbath school in the sense that, brothers and sisters, I'm not teaching the 2520 here today. What I'm doing here today in this presentation is more fit for a Sabbath school presentation. I disagree with the men that are rejecting the 2520. And from my consideration of those men that are rejecting the 2520, they base their rejection upon the Hebrew in Leviticus 26. And I just gave you an example why I think that's faulty reasoning. They're doing it for the linguistics of the Hebrew when it's obviously a, a symbolic word that they're dealing with and symbols need to be determined by context and based upon the rule of first mention Leviticus 25 and 26 the context has to be set within the year day principle of Bible prophecy Amen. okay so if you go to Leviticus 25 just for a moment I'll, I'll show you why I don't I don't have no indication whatsoever that William Miller understand what we're saying here this morning but he still got it right. Verse 8 of Leviticus 25. We're going to deal more with this as we proceed, but I just want to show you one thing here. Verse 8 of Leviticus 25. 
It says, and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee. And this Hebrew word that's translated seven here, this is the same word that's translated, this Hebrew word that's translated as seven here is the one that we just considered that's translated as seventh also. Okay? And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty-nine years. So this Hebrew word that's translated as seven in this verse is there four times. And this same Hebrew word is in Leviticus 26, four times only there. It's not translated as seven. It's translated as seven times. So verse nine says, Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month and the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. So... When I, well, I'm saying that Miller got it right, even though I don't know that he was seeing that Leviticus 25 is the year day principle, William Miller employed the year day principle when he came to Leviticus 26, right? And this is the, the statute of letting the land rest every seventh year, right? And they were to do that. How come you all look so subdued this morning? Did you not get a lot of rest? Are you with me? Okay, so there, six years they were to work the land, right? And then one year let it rest. And how many times were they to do that? Seven times. Is that seven? Yep. So in this 49 year cycle, how many, time, how many years did they work the land? 42. And how many years did they let the land rest if they would have been faithful? Seven. And they were to let the land rest seven years. How many months in a biblical year? And how many days in a biblical month? So what does that equal? How many days total, days, were they let the land rest in this 49-year cycle? When they broke this statute, they were punished for seven times. And William Miller said, because they broke this statute of not letting the land rest for 2,520 days in this 49-year cycle, that they were to be scattered for 2,520 years. And he applied the year-day principle, which is the rule of first mention in Leviticus 25 and 26. It's to be applied there. So William Miller had it spot on. Have you ever seen this formula before? 7 times 12 times 30 equals 2520? It's right up there. That's Miller's logic. Now, I don't think he was... I haven't ever heard him say that he sees the year-day principle in the first seven verses of Leviticus 25. And I know that here at the end of the world, when we have a, a willingness to set aside... Almost all the counsel of the spirit of prophecy and much of the counsel of the Bible is God's people at the end of the world. It's very difficult when we have this mindset to think that when we are told that it was the angel Gabriel that guided the mind of William Miller, that that really is relevant. But I find from my study that William Miller got it right, even though he wasn't understanding all the arguments in his favor that we're recognizing. And I give credit to the angel Gabriel. And I know that there's some people that struggle with that. But who is Gabriel? Who did he replace? He replaced Lucifer. Who's Lucifer? What's that mean? So what's Gabriel doing once Lucifer set aside? He's bringing the light. And we're told he brought the light to William Miller. So the, the light that William Miller got. Don't know that we should be so flippant about setting that aside. So... Back to your notes. Back to your notes, if you would. As I said, my argument here this morning is not to give you a study on the 2520. Maybe some of you haven't studied it out. I think probably most of you have. I'm going to appeal to your logic this morning. Try to. You know, what the Bible says about Paul. Paul reasoned with them in their synagogue. That's what I'm going to try to do, is reason with us this morning. It says in Isaiah, what? Come, let us reason together. Okay? 
When we're willing to set aside the 2520 based upon our modern theologians' understanding of the Hebrew, it's not just Leviticus 26 that we're challenging. The 2520 is throughout the scriptures over and over again. So I just want to review some of these and tell you that that definitely I'm not a college-educated theologian. I'm a retired plastering contractor. The only college I ever had is when I got out of the military. I went to college so I could get some GI benefits. I wasn't there to study anything. I just wanted the money. And I didn't stay very long. Okay, so I'm not a, I'm not a smart man in that regard. But for me, it's difficult to see this much evidence in God's Word in support of the 2520 and not understand that this is genuine. So I'm just going to give you a few examples of that that makes me unable to understand how men can be fighting against this truth. Um, In your notes, this is pioneer understanding from this point on, just to put a few things in place. I'm on page 11. Um, Hosea... Okay, he's taken captive in 723. You have the biblical reference. This is the beginning of the 2520 for the northern kingdom. 723. Is this too little for all of you to see up here? I don't know what to do about that. What this is, is Isaiah 7. This is Isaiah 7. How many of you have read any of uh, Edward Reed's book, Even at the Door, or the one about his coming? I forget the title. Sunday's coming and even at the door. In one of those books, if you've read that, he has an appendix which Walter Veith here recently referred to. But in the appendix, they have went through some people at the Ellen White Estate and they've looked at all the places that Sister White mentions the age of the earth. And then they went through her personal library where she had Bible chronologies. And they've determined based upon what she has said about the age of the earth that the Bible chronology that she employed Sister White, was Usher's chronology. And if you have a King James Version Bible that has dating in it, the King James Bible that you have that has dating in it, it's based upon James Usher's chronology. And more often than not, the pioneers of Adventism referred to James Usher. So King James Bible, Spirit of Prophecy, pioneers of Adventism, James Usher is a very reputable chronologist, all right? And he marks Isaiah 7. This is what we're looking at up here in the year 742. And the chronologists will tell you that the safest dates in their chronology is when you have more than one king or historical figure noted. And in this passage in Isaiah 7, you have the king of Assyria, the king of the northern kingdom Israel, and the king of Judah, all referenced. So this is a very safe date. The vision of Isaiah 7 is given in the year 742 B.C. And in verse 8, there is a prophecy of 65 years. The pioneers refer to this. If you want to see this nicely broke down, download Hiram Edson's articles from the Old Review and Heralds called The Times of the Gentiles, and he will cover this history very nicely for you. And Hiram Edson is someone that the Lord had confidence in. He's the one that was given the vision on October 23rd that it... 1844 that explained Christ moving from the holy to the most holy place. And he, all, the, the whites evidently had enough confidence in Hiram Edson to name their son after him. And he explains Isaiah 7 as I'm going to explain it here in a brief overview. As I said, I'm not teaching the 2520 here. I'm going to reason with you about some of the simple logic here. In this narrative of Isaiah 7, there is a civil war going on between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. It's about to happen. I shouldn't say it's going on. It's about to happen. The the southern kingdom of Judah is being threatened by the northern kingdom of Israel, who has formed an alliance with Syria. And the southern kingdom, it's scared. What's the smallest tribe? Benjamin. Benjamin. So the southern kingdom is Judah and Benjamin, and Benjamin is the smallest tribe. So you've got... Two kingdoms that are being threatened by ten kingdoms plus Syria. So they're scared and Isaiah comes to the king of the south, the king of Judah, Ahaz, in a time period when there's a civil war starting between the north and the south and gives him a prophecy. 
and says within, and the key word in verse 8 is within. It doesn't say in, it says within 65 years, the northern kingdom will be no more. And sure enough, you have it in your notes, 723 BC, 19 years later, the northern kingdom is carried into captivity. And when the 65 years end, 46 years later, the southern kingdom is carried into captivity. And that's both the starting points for both 2520s. And brothers and sisters, this is, if, if I'm in a delusion on this subject, it's this kind of biblical history that places me locked into a delusion that I don't know how to get out of. Because when I see this scattering begin in 723 BC and the second one begin in 677, and then I realize that the first one ends in 1798, and the second one ends in 1844, yeah. that's beyond coincidental to me. I can't, I can't buy that this is a false prophecy because the modern theologians don't accept the Hebrew of Leviticus 26. When it's not about the Hebrew, it's about the context because it's a symbolic word they're dealing with. So you notice that from 1798 to 1844, you have 46 years paralleling this 46 years. But this prophecy of 65 years, it begins... 19 years before the 46 years end starts. So when this 46 years ends at, in 1844, you go 19 years to the future, you come to 1863. This is a, a chiastic structure. And this isn't time setting, brothers and sisters. Time setting is when I tell you that um, July 17th, this year, there's going to be a Sunday law in the United States. That's time setting. This is looking back at history and putting the pieces in place. This is not time setting, even though, <laughs> even though there's people that say, hey, we identified something that happened on 9-11-2001, that's time setting. Sorry, we weren't predicting in advance that on 9-11-2001 something was going to happen. If, if it's, an, yeah, it's an event that you're marking just happened to be on that day. So, what happened in 1863? Now, all of you that have been involved with the controversy of the 2520 probably know that one of the claims they make is Great Controversy 351. They read into that paragraph where they say that the 2300 days is the longest and last prophecy. And it's a misreading of the history. But in that paragraph, if you remember, how many are familiar with that paragraph? Okay, in that paragraph, one of the things she's teaching is that the disciples were teaching a portion of the same prophecy that the Millerites were preaching, were they not? Okay, so they were, they were both preaching a prophecy based upon Daniel 9 and the 2300 days. Amen? Do you follow me? Okay, but in Daniel 12, what happened to the book of Daniel? It was sealed up. And hold your thoughts. How long was it sealed up for in Daniel 12? Until when? Until the time of the end. And when's the time of the end? When, uh, let's keep it simple. Let's keep it at the basic. The book of Daniel and Daniel 12.4 is sealed up to the time of the end. And in Great Controversy 356, what does Sister White tell us the time of the end is? So how is it that the disciples in the time of Christ could be preaching a prophecy that had been sealed up hundreds of years before in Daniel 12? It had to be unsealed. When was it unsealed? Well, right here in, in Isaiah 7:14, in this same passage, it says that there would be a sign, and the sign for the time of Christ was the birth of Christ. And I don't know if the year 3 B.C. or 2 B.C. is correct for his birth, but that was the time of the end for the history of Christ. And the book of Daniel was unsealed. And the message for that time period is that the Christ was going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in order to proclaim that message, the book of Daniel had to be unsealed. It had been sealed up in Daniel 12. But the book of Daniel, it gets sealed back up, right? Go to Daniel 9. Go to Daniel 9, verse 24. Daniel 9.24 says this. 
Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to what? Seal, Seal up the vision and prophecy. When, what prophecy were they dealing with? The book of Daniel. Okay, it's Daniel chapter 9. And at the end of the 70 weeks, it says that the book of Daniel is going to be sealed up. What was the end of the 70 weeks? Well, it was AD 34, right? And what happened in AD 34? Stephen was stoned, and a church was set aside, and a new church was started. Ancient Israel was divorced from God, and the Christian church began in AD 34. Please take note. That at the point in time when the book of Daniel is sealed up, there's a church that starts. Okay, So it's, it's sealed up in AD 34 because it's going to have to be unsealed in 1798 at the time of the end for this history. Okay, So if you go back to the beginning of the 2520 with this chiastic structure, you find that this prophecy of 65 years is given at the in the time period of an impending civil war between north and south. It has two marked periods of time, 19 years followed by 46 years. And when these two prophecies start in this history, when they end down here in the Millerite history, the one ends and then 46 years later the other ends. And then 19 years later, what do we have? We, well, in the time period of a civil war, there's a church that starts. And you go, how many of you are familiar with one of the main motivations for starting the church? It's because of the Civil War. Seventh-day Adventists didn't want their sons to be drafted into the army in order to have uh, religious, uh, religious... What's it called? To be able to not serve in the military? Conscientious, Conscientious objector status. You had to be connected with a legitimate, organized, recognized church. So because of the Civil War was one of the main motivations to start a church in 1863. Okay, So when the church is started in AD 34, what happens to the prophecy? It's sealed up. When the church is started in 1863, you remember Thomas Francis, the pioneer Thomas Francis, and, and the other pioneer George Harriet? You remember those two pioneers? No? Because in 1863, they both took the position, these pioneers, that the 2520 wasn't valid. You don't remember these pioneers? I made them up. <laughs> in order for the sealing to begin, brothers and sisters, it couldn't be someone in the Millerite movement, in the Advent movement, that was an unknown. When the sealing up process begins, it's going to have to be accomplished by someone that is recognizable Amen. to mark the beginning of the sealing up of the foundational truths. Amen. You ever heard of James White? Okay, James White, 1863, comes out with the 1863 chart. It's just numbers. No commentary. Bible verses. It can't speak. But they removed from that chart what? They removed the very first prophecy that William Miller had discovered. And the process of sealing up the foundational truths had begun. And I hear it claimed that Sister White as a prophetess could not really be a prophetess unless she saw that as a crisis and took action. That's not true. That's not true, brothers and sisters. We can't judge the role of a prophetess at the level of human. All right. See, the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. We, we won't have time to get to this. I wish we would. I, I like this study that we won't get to. But in the Alpha Apostasy in the early part of the 20th century, in the early 1900s, in the Alpha Apostasy, the argument that took place had to do with rewriting history. The battle was over early writing 74. 
And three men led out to rewrite the history connected with early writing 74, W.W. Prescott, A.G. Daniels, and Willie White. They rewrote the history that's represented in early writing 74 in order to turn the understanding of the pioneer position of the daily upside down. And they did so. And the alpha apostasy is based upon early writing 74. In early writing 74 is where Sister White is speaking about this chart. I was shown that the 1843 was, chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. And that the Lord held his hand over a mistake in some of the figures until his hand was removed. Brothers and sisters, the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. And this chart is based on Habakkuk 2. And Habakkuk 2 and this chart gave to the Millerites a purposeful mistake to test them. Amen. And that history is repeated to the very letter at the end. And there's a mistake that tests us. I don't know that it's a mistake, but it's a test that has been designed by God. And it has to do with the foundational truths. So to say that Sister White had to say something in 1863 about that chart is to not understand Millerite history and that it's going to be repeated. Because if the Lord chooses to design a test for us here at the end of the world, and he dis determines that this test is going to be about the removal of the foundations of Adventism, and he decides that his prophet isn't going to protest about the beginning of the sealing up the foundational truths, that's God's prerogative, and he did it in the Millerite history. And the very same argument is taking place today over the 2520 because they're once again rewriting history. Amen. And they're rewriting the history that is represented in early writings, page 236. And early writings 236 is Sister White's commentary on early writings 74. Amen. Early writings 74 is the alpha argument, and early writings 236 is the omega argument. And in early writings 236, she conclusively identifies that the 2520 is a valid prophecy. Amen. Just like she conclusively identifies in early writings 74 that the daily is paganism. But in both these arguments, there's a rewriting of history. Okay, I've got, I've got off target here. Um, it, when am I supposed to end? No, 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 whenever I want. No, we've got to keep all things decent and in order. 10.45. Okay, 10.45. We're, we're on, on target. Go to your notes, if you would. <clears throat> These notes were designed as a 10-part series that we're only doing five of. So at this point in time... I knew when I was doing the 10 Bart series that I was going to conclude with showing that Sister White supports the 2520. So I, I just put a couple of things in here where she supports the 2520. The one I want you to see here is an earnest in Patriarchs and Pro Prophets, page 382. I'm on page 11 of my notes, third paragraph down from the top. Faithfully, the prophets continued their warnings and their exhortations. Fearlessly, they spoke to Manasseh and to his people. But the messages were scorned. Backsliding Judah would not heed. As in earnest of what would befall the people should they continue in penitent, the Lord permitted their king to be captured by a band of Assyrian soldiers who bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon, their temporary capital. An earnest from Sister White's day and age is defined by Webster's as the first fruits, that which is in advance and gives promise of something to come. The first fruits. Okay, now brothers and sisters, if I have a peach tree and the first peaches to come to, to, to be ripe, I go out and pick. But the rest of the peaches, it's going to be another week or so before they're ripe. When I go out in a week or so, am I going to find apples on that tree? Okay, first fruits, the same thing. Okay, it's the beginning of the same thing. Manasseh is the first fruit. He's the earnest payment. He's the down payment of what's to come. He's the, he's the symbol of the 2520. Have you ever did a search to see how long Manasseh was in captivity? No one knows, man, but there's a lot of discussion about it. I put my vote in there that he was there seven years. The Jewish, the Jewish scholars say it's something like 11 years. So to say seven years is not beyond reason. The Jews 
put it up over 10 years. I'll say it was seven years based upon the other testimonies of the 2520 with Nebuchadnezzar and Jacob. Manasseh went in there for 2,520 days because he was the first fruit of what, would, what was about to come on ancient Israel. <coughs> when it comes to the 2520 in Leviticus 25 and 26, we need to reason from cause to effect. Even the people that are arguing against the 2520 will admit that from verse 14 onward in Leviticus 26 that this is God's curse. But they refuse to take the second step and say if these verses in Leviticus 26 verses 14 and onward are the curse, what caused the curse? Notice Proverbs 26 two, As the bird wandering as the swallow by flying, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. If we're going to consider the curse in Leviticus 26, we have a responsibility of, as Bereans, as students of prophecy, to find out what the cause of the curse was. And what's the cause of the curse in Leviticus 26? It's that they broke the statutes of Leviticus 25. They wouldn't enter into the... They wouldn't let the land rest every seventh year, and they wouldn't observe the Jubilee rest. So you can't separate Leviticus. You shouldn't separate Leviticus 26 and 25. If you're unwilling to reason from cause to effect, you can do this very thing. Notice this next quote. We should know for ourselves what constitutes Christianity, what is truth, what is the faith that we have received, what are the Bible rules the rules given us from the highest authority. We should know what the Bible rules are that have been given to us from the highest authority. What are those rules? William Miller's rules of prophetic interpretation. They've been given to us by the highest authority, and we should know what they are. And I know that you're all familiar with the quote that those people that are given the third angel's message, they're going to be using those rules. But it goes on, it says, There are many who believe without a reason on which they base their faith without such sufficient evidence as to tr the truth of the matter. Brothers and sisters, my experience is virtually everything, this is just one example, virtually everything that I've come to understand about the daily is because someone come to me that knew a little bit more about this subject of the daily that I did, and they were opposed to what I was teaching, and they'd throw some question in my face that I thought, wow, I don't have the answer to that one. <laughs> So I want to remind you from my experience, from my experience, what's going on here in this town? This is the Lord trying to bless you. Amen. You, you cannot possess this message unless you possess it for yourself. Amen. You can't stand on the faith of your husband or your wife or your dad and your mom. And if this message is what we're understanding it to be, you have to be, it has to become part of you and you can't do it because you're just a human being like me and everyone else. You don't have the power to incorporate this message into yourself. It's something that the Lord has to do with your participation. And my experience is, is that the way the Lord does it for us, because we're Laodiceans and we're unwilling to do our homework on our own initiative, is he confronts us with those that are opposing the truth and he forces us to our knees in prayer and he forces us to break open the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. So when things get really tough around here, I, I'm telling you that whether you can see through the darkness and the shadows at this time, it's a blessing. Amen. He's grounding you in to the message. There are many who believe without a reason on which to base their faith without sufficient evidence as to the truth of the matter. If an idea is pre presented that harmonizes with their own preconceived opinions, they are all ready to accept it. They do not reason from cause to effect. Their faith has no genuine foundation. And, the time of trial, they, and in the time of trial, they will find that they have built upon sand. Who is it that builds upon sand? It's this movement that is the omega apostasy, that storm and tempest is going to sweep away the structure. That's the movement that builds upon sand instead of building upon what? The rock upon these. He who rests satisfied with his own present imperfect knowledge of the scriptures, thinking this is sufficient for his salvation, 
is resting in a fatal deception. There are many who are not thoroughly furnished with scriptural arguments. I heard an, a, a sister, I don't know who she is, I have read a sister recently within the past couple of weeks in one of the discussions on the internet that people forward me that they're having. And this sister, which is really, really strong, not, not mean-spirited, but just really strong. I know without a doubt and of an absolute cer- certainty with those kind of expressions that what's being taught by these men concerning the 2520 today, the pioneers never taught. And she was making that sound like that was an argument against the 2520. But I agree with her. The pioneers understood the 2520, but they were not seeing the things about the 2520 that are being recognized today. Okay, they weren't, they weren't recognizing that this 46-year period here has to do with the Lord raising up the Millerite temple so he had a host to enter into covenant with in 1844 and that the number 46 is always associated with the temple. They weren't seeing that it was 46 days that Moses was receiving the instructions on building the temple or that it was 46 years that it took Herod to do his remodeling or that there's 46 chromosomes in the human temple. But we are. But that doesn't mean that we're teaching different than the pioneers. It just means that the line of the tribe of Judah is building upon that foundation bigger and brighter truths. There are many who are not thoroughly furnished with scriptural arguments that they may be able to discern error and condemn all the tradition and superstition that has been palmed off as truth. Satan has introduced his own ideas into the worship of God that he might corrupt the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. A large number who claim to believe present truth know not what constitutes the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What's the faith once delivered to the saints? We, we read a quote last night that, that identified what the faith once delivered to the saints was. What's the faith? <laughs> Is these charts. How are these charts... Christ in us, the hope of glory. How could, the, how could this chart here, this is a bunch, of, a bunch of prophecy, is it not? How can that be Christ in us, the hope of glory? Where does this chart come from? Let's, let's go and close here. Go to Habakkuk 2. Now I heard people saying you have to eat it. I agree with that. You have to eat it. Where was it that Christ lost the greatest majority of his disciples? It was in John chapter 6, was it not? When he says, I'm the bread of heaven, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And what history did Christ refer to when he was making that presentation? The manna in the wilderness. And what was the manna? What was the manna? I mean, what did the Jews think of the manna? What's the name manna? What is it? When the bread of heaven comes, God's people look at it and say, well, what is it? When Jesus says, I'm the bread of heaven, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. The Jews in his day and age said, what, are we to be cannibals? They couldn't understand at the prophetic level. They couldn't understand that he was giving a literal to represent a spiritual. They refused to apply it prophetically. It was the prophetic test that they failed. And where did they fail that prophetic test? In John 6, 6, 6. And all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. And those in Adventism that fail the prophetic test in our day and age that do not eat the bread of heaven, they're going to demonstrate that they prepared a character for the mark of the beast when 666 arrives at the Sunday law. So how is it that this prophetic message can be Christ in us, the hope of glory? Habakkuk 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. This chart is what demonstrates 
who's justified by faith in contrast with those who are lifted up in self-exaltation. The symbol of that self-exaltation in God's word is the daily. Now you, may, you and I may not understand how the faith once delivered to the saints can be Christ in us, the hope of glory. We may be able to express it at the prophetic level with the terms, we must eat the little book, we must eat his flesh and blood, but we may not really understand the process by which this is accomplished. But God's word says that's how it happens. And God's word has the creative power that he used to create heaven and earth in it. And if we will feed upon this word, that creative power will justify us by faith and produce Christ in us, the hope of our glory. And to not stand on this foundation, to not continue to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end is to be lifted up in self-exaltation. Okay, let me, let me close this off. This, this passage is good. I didn't read it all. I won't read it all. <coughs> I want to tell you what I've tried to do here in advance of what we're going to do. Last night, we showed you, if you haven't noticed it before, that the two places that we typically refer to for the year-day principle when we're teaching time prophecy and Adventism is Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. We typically have not recognized that both of these histories are representing rebellions against a type of rest. 14.34, it's the rest of grace that prevented them from entering into the promised land. And the reason that they failed that test is they'd forgotten their foundational truths when he brought them out of Egypt, the signs and wonders. But by the end of ancient Israel, their rebellion was against the seventh-day Sabbath. Last night we tried to suggest that this history was illustrating us here at the end of the world. That those people that will re reject the rest of the old pass of Jeremiah 6, 16, if they continue to hold in that rebellion, will develop a character that will be demonstrated at the Sunday Law as a character prepared to worship on Sunday instead of Sabbath, thus fulfilling this history. This morning, I want to introduce to you that even the theologians of modern Adventism have identified that the year-day principle is marked at the very beginning of Leviticus 25. And therefore, the passage in Leviticus 25 and 26 has to be governed, understood, studied from the point of the year-day principle. So when you get to the curse of Leviticus 26, the seven times, you have a responsibility, if you're going to be honest to your responsibility as a Berean, to understand why the curse came. And the curse came because the statutes of Leviticus 25 were broken. But the statutes of Leviticus 25 are set in the context of the year-day principle. So Miller was absolutely correct to identify that the curse was 2,520 years. The leap that I am trying to make for us here is that it is this rebellion of refusing to work, walk in the old path at the end of the world, that this rebellion is symbolically represented by the resting of the land. Because the rebellion is always against some kind of rest. And the resting of the land, the 2520, that's this rebellion. And it's this rebellion that if we hold on to prevents us from entering into the promised land and begins the process of preparing us to reject the seventh day Sabbath in the very near future, brothers and sisters, the very near future. When, you, when, you get, when you're willing to wrap your mind around the fact that when the per persecution such as beginning here now is underway, that this is the binding off. This is the binding off process. This is the beginning of the outpouring. Now, I know every one of you probably thinks I'm talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but I'm not. This is the outpouring of the strong delusion. You can have a different idea about what he preaches or what he preaches. But when you get to the point where you actually start to persecute people for what they believe about the Bible, you're marking the beginning of the strong delusion of 2 Thessalonians, the outpouring, because that comes just before the Sunday law, according to the spirit of prophecy. So what I'm saying is, this subject of the 2520 is this argument right here. And those people, 
those people that are on the right side of the argument, from my biblical understanding, they're the minority. Who are they? Pardon me? No, who are they? They're Joshua and Caleb. They're coming and saying, hey, it's time to go into the promised land, and they're outnumbered, 10 to 2. Okay, 10 to 2. And the majority of God's people, they're going to side with the 10. Okay, that's where we're at. And nothing's going to be allowed to stand in the way of the movement of these 10. Because it's the, the Omega. This is the final apostasy. The one that prevents Adventism from going into the promised land. Okay, there will be some that go in. Joshua and Caleb went in. Okay. So that's what we're saying. And now from here, once we've tried to put an emphasis on what the 2520 is all about in terms of rebellion and Adventism, as represented by the Year Day Principle, we're going to begin to dissect the 2300-year prophecy, which is the central pillar of Adventism, and show that the 2300-year prophecy, that Palmoni, the wonderful number, Christ, when he thought about the 2300-year prophecy, whenever he thought about it, so many, I don't know, long ago, that he determined back then that he was going to build the 2300-year prophecy based upon Leviticus 25 and 26 because he knew that this was going to be the argument here at the end of the world. And when you reject the 2520, you are rejecting the central pillar of Adventism. That's what we're going to take up the rest of the day. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to be among those that rightly relate to the signs that you have given us and not to be as the ten unfaithful spies, not to be as Ahaz, who refused to select a sign when Isaiah asked him to do so. We want to understand that we are to enter into this rest, to receive the message of this rest. But we know that this is the the crisis just before we enter the promised land and that those that are going to be faithful to this unfolding of light are going to be in a minority. Uh, They're going to be persecuted, rejected, and despised of men, and we thank you for this process. We understand that if we don't go through this experience here in our church, that we will not have the spiritual muscle to stand in the Sunday law crisis when all the earthly authorities are going to be turned against God's faithful. So we praise you for bringing us into this time where we can allow your Holy Spirit to prune us and prepare us for the the crisis of the Sunday law that's about to hit. And we understand the fact that we're in this crisis now tells us that the Sunday law is just around the corner, that you're raising us up for this period and trying to get us in shape. We ask that you continue to bless us throughout this Sabbath, uh, that your Holy Spirit would continue to direct our studies, our considerations, and that you'd remind us that this is the Sabbath and that at the in-between times that we relate to it as so with our conversation and our thoughts. Please continue to bless, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.